This is my commentary on chapter 29 of Lila, An Inquiry into Morals by Robert N. Persick. Actually, I had a feeling the worst was over. The ominous thing about last night back in Manhattan was that she seemed so happy. She wasn't suffering. When she hugged and rocked that doll, it was like listening to someone freezing to death say they feel warm. You want to say, no, no, feel the cold. As long as you're suffering, you're all right. Well, that's an interesting thing to say. As long as you're suffering, you're all right. You would think it would be the opposite. But if you're suffering, if you're not suffering when you should be suffering, then there is a problem. It's like not feeling pain. So the happiness that Lila was experiencing is a demonstration of what Phaedrus calls low-quality intellectual patterns, which is how he classifies insanity in the metaphysics of quality frame. And I'll read that quote in a second. But insane people prefer their delusional world to the real one. And why wouldn't they? That delusional world solves the problems that they have in the real world. So they can take all the things that make them feel terrible and upset them in the real world and split them off, oppress them, dissociate from them, and their mind gives them this fantasy world, which makes sense. Like, for example, the things that were denied to Lila come true in that delusion. Her baby's alive. Her dog is alive. She actually has a home to go to, the island. It all represents all the, the meaningful social life events that she was unable to obtain in, in real life. So Phaedrus, having been crazy himself, or it's, it's, uh, it's kind of... So Phaedrus, having been crazy himself, or at least being labeled by society as crazy, you and I both realized that what he went through was something not, perhaps it manifested as insanity, but it was something like extremely high quality insight, um, which we'll get to also, is trying to figure out what to do with Lila not only practically, but philosophically, as in what is insanity, actually. So what isn't insanity? What is truth is a good frame to begin with, as it is the nature and subjectivity of truth that is in question here and in other places in this chapter. And in fact, it's a sub-theme of this book, an important sub-theme of this book. If objects are the ultimate reality, then there is only one true intellectual construction of things that which corresponds to the objective world. But if truth is defined as a high quality set of intellectual value patterns, then insanity can be defined as just a low quality set of intellectual value patterns. And you get a whole different picture of it. So insanity is maybe not that different from sanity. And in, in some cases, in some cases it's really hard to tell the difference. But the high quality set of intellectual patterns helps you navigate the world much better than a low quality set of intellectual patterns. And that evokes something that Peterson once said, which is there are some games that are much more playable than others. And I think that that's what that means. But let's delve into what Persig means by low quality, because this is one of the more difficult things to understand about the metaphysics of quality. So, so far we've seen that low quality can mean is too dynamic to be sustainable or is too static to be changeable, or there's a favoring of a lower level of evolution over the higher, allowing that one to dominate and suppressing the higher level, when that higher level is actually functioning very well, because that higher level can also be too dynamic or too static, and in that case, the lower level might need to come in and perform some updates. So Lila, Lila's trance is low quality, again, because it prevents her from acting in the world. She's just sitting there in a trance, but also because it makes other people, per se, Phaedrus, uncomfortable. So while Phaedrus is giving us a new lens, which connects people who are sane and insane through quality of, of their intellectual understanding, he also recognizes the fact that insane people can be very difficult to deal with, as he is now experiencing. So generally, the severely mentally ill especially have some presentation that makes them kind of intolerable. 
because socially they are threatening, they're relentless, they're frustrating, they're uh, seeing you as an enemy when you're not, they're imagining things, or it seems like they're imagining things that, that you did or said that you didn't. But let's talk about the word intolerable. So if you see someone in a trance, it's disconcerting. We we'll worry about them, we feel bad, we're frustrated that they don't come out of the trance. And then we kind of get mad at them, like they're doing it on purpose. Yet, in a movie theater, if someone isn't in a trance, like say there's a schizophrenic in the audience who's not buying into the trance, that's not believing the movie, that's not getting involved in the movie, and is yelling at the screen and calling it out and not buying into the ruse, the same way the schizophrenics did not buy into the ruse of when people were pretending to be schizophrenic, then they're insane for not being in a trance. So what's intolerable, say, is largely determined on the social level, and insanity can be framed as primarily a social disease. Perhaps it has biological support that would guide someone in that direction, but Robert Sapolsky said that you may have a proclivity for schizophrenia, but if you have a good environment, your chances are really decreased as to whether that, that genetic predisposition is going to engage. So even the biological underpinning of mental illness can be subverted with, with um, a good social environment. So what he says about trance, what Pedra says about, um, about trance is interesting because it's also a powerful force for cultural reinforcement. And for this reason, the, cultural, the cu culture promotes movies and censors them for its own benefit. And, and obviously today we see this playing out big time. It's a hypnosis, this trance state in the form of political cultural propaganda that's infused into just about every aspect of human endeavor these days. It's, it's, it's insane. So you could say we're all insane in this, in this divided world. And these days, many of us would sooner spend the night, in fact, in a room with a schizophrenic than, say, a Trump-supporting anti-vaxxer or a blue-haired equity, they-them advocate, uh, depending on whether you're watching the Yanni or the Laurel movie. So we think that that person is insane. But we are insane, or at least hypnotized, for not seeing through the social split, for not seeing how effectively superficial this division is and how it's been instilled in us through this, this trance of propaganda, for this trance that we're in because of this propaganda. Cognitive science is really revealing exactly how insane we really are. And this is Persick's point. We believe that the ghosts that inhabit our psyche are real and to divide ourselves away from those ghosts. Remember how difficult it was to do in chapter three of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. It really takes a leap of, of you know, it takes a whole paradigm shift to see how hypnotized we actually are. So it's funny, going through this chapter, he's trying to figure out what's, lo what's wrong with his engine, and at the same time he's trying to figure out exactly what's wrong with Lila, with her engine, which is her head, let's say. And he's trying to diagnose both of their engines at the same time. The, the stuff that's happening with the engine and the boat, I don't know how this is related to Lila. Like there's an assumption that the engine of the boat is filled with debris, but when he goes and reaches down there, he sees that it's not. And he can't figure out what's wrong. So what does that say about Lila? I guess the translate state, the debris is, you know, not, not, not engaging at all. So Lila said she was a loner and she seems to voluntarily reject social rules. Contrarians just seem to savagely attack every kind of static moral pattern they can find. It seems as though they're trying to destroy morality as a kind of revenge. Now, why wouldn't Lila want to have revenge on static morality because it's really been the thing that has um, that has really bit her. She's she's found some satisfaction because she was not able to have normal social engagement 
and I think a lot of it was not her fault. It was she was really guided in a direction of true of, of believing that she was inferior. You know, imagine having a mother like that, and a grandfather who had a very Manichaean view of good and evil. So she was just set up for failure socially to begin with, and probably some some biological aspects to it, but. Her true self is ra a rather moral person, if you think about it, because first of all, she was depending that, that, defending that little kid in the store, and that was a little black kid, a little black girl. So she's certainly not racist. In fact, she probably saw this and, and her boyfriend was black. So she doesn't have any of that kind of problem. She believes people are people, and she says this, just let live and let live. She's really not judgmental until someone judges her first and that is her true self i think and remember how regal said she was very sweet so imagine what that must have been like to just have you know have all these barriers to just living her life and she's built up a socially oppositional defense against a lot of essential disappointments and if there is a biological component, which I, I, I suspect there is because the medications work on her delusions, um, that's probably not going to show up until later. That's typically how it works. So Regal, you know, might be confused as to why she's different uh, later. And I think that that might be part of, part of the reason. So back to the contrarian topic, and this emphasizes something Persic has said already, that it's really difficult to discern a degenerate and a visionary in action. It may take a very long time to figure out which is which. Both are opposing static patterns, which are generally social patterns, and both types are moving towards dynamic quality and away from rigidity, away from, from static laws that are keeping them down. In the case of visionaries, though, there's a certain self-sacrifice, which may even be unconscious for the greater good, like, no, like going towards the greater good, rather than going towards one's personal satisfaction, I think is, is the main difference. Because the degenerate only wants what's best for himself. However, the degenerate, uh, if he's impactful enough in his pursuit of selfish means, may actually end up changing things for the better, just shaking things up. You know, I, I, the obvious <laughs> the obvious example of that is Donald Trump, but I, I don't think he's the only one. So mentally ill and self-destructive people can have a handle on what's what's best in the big scale, like someone like Van Gogh, for example, who never made any money, who really was mentally ill, knew that that instead of representing things realistically, he saw meaning in dynamic situations and tried to create an analog of that dynamism. And in doing so, totally changed art from something that was representational. Now, I, I know the Impressionists had already done this, but there's something about Van Gogh that adds this different layer to it that, that adds meaning. Whereas there is something very technical in the Impressionists. So, and Van Gogh really stands out amongst all of them as the one who's the most famous, the most iconic, the most valuable. So he's, he's thinking, so Phaedrus is thinking about Lila and what is she going to do to solve, how can she solve her problem? And there are some ways we already know that we deal with mentally ill people, but another way that, that we don't, and this is the way that he's promoting. So Lila's been stuck in a loop of self-destruction, right? The same that addicts experience. Whereas she's in pain and pain, pain, and then uses some biological thing to get out of it, whether it's booze or sex or um, hooking up with a new guy or uh, finding a place to sleep, whatever it is. So Phaedra sees an opportunity here in her unmedicated state to actually overcome that with some dynamic solution. And what that solution would be, who knows. Now the two solutions available to her, the standard solution is one 
the bad one is just go with the live in the stay in the delusional world you know don't feel the cold and likely be institutionalized the second one is is what typically happens is become a member of some mental health agency and get medication and sometimes if you're really mentally ill you'll be on the act team and you're allowed to live on the street or you know allowed um the way mental health laws are now you you really can't intervene a lot but if someone is willing to be part of the act team then they'll live on the street and you'll then they'll come get their shot to keep the the ghosts away so so that so you'll have that institutionalized so you have that outpatient thing where they get meds and a case manager and therapy and probably live off the state if they're willing to to um, go to public housing but the third way and the best way is the dynamic way and he doesn't explain what that is and with good reason because we don't know what that is we don't know what her dynamic solution is going to be so the first thing that comes to my mind is maybe if we want to speculate maybe it's some kind of religious or spiritual conversion and being involved in that or maybe it's tapping into something artistic or maybe it's realizing that her caring nature is an asset and becoming more involved with say battered women or uh, being a peer counselor or something of that nature where she where she actually helps other people having been through it herself that's a possibility i think under you know with a little bit of a maybe spiritual religious conversion she could become that kind of person so there's there's some dynamic solutions that maybe um, if you just leave someone alone to figure it out they make they may arrive at here's how he puts it so the third possibility that Phaedrus was hoping for was that by some miracle of understanding Lila could avoid all the patterns her own and cultures see the dynamic quality she's working toward and then come back and handle all this mess without being destroyed by it the question is whether she's going to work through whatever it is that makes the defense necessary defense of the uh the trance and the insanity or whether she, you know the delusional world or whether she's going to work around it if she works through it she'll come out at a dynamic solution and I like the way he makes a definitive statement of that nature that really has implications for you know helping people with mental health issues if she works around it she'll just head back to the old karmic cycle cycles of pain and temporary relief and remember that if she gets her meds you know she can go back to being old Lila I mean, then that's that's option option two. Are we a hundred percent sure she needs meds? This is opens up a whole way of seeing this problem. So I guess the point of this is there are solutions to really difficult problems if you allow the state of not knowing, of not trying to fix it right away with something because you think it's so bad because you're so bothered by this crazy person and allowing the person to arrive at a new solution rather than rely completely on established ones. Your solution by definition will be more, no, more dynamic and maybe much more appropriate to the situation, to the individual situation, more true, let's say. And this has been a major theme of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance and is now being reinforced in this chapter of Lila, but it requires tossing off traps, you know, like, like the anxiety of trying to solve something right away that seems really terrible and everyone being upset with this, you know, wanting this crazy person just to be resolved right away. And that, that's a tough, that's a tall order. Apparently, whatever caused the, that engine overheating was gone. He sure couldn't reproduce it now. He shut off the engine and the boat and eased forward toward the anchor. So that might be sort of leaving her alone. You know, she's coming out of the trance in this chapter, uh, let, just letting it go. So the last part of this chapter deals with William James. And like I said, William James is closely associated with Percy because as we'll see, the metaphysical quality is very similar to, to William James' philosophy. James said, truth is one species of good and not as is usually supposed a category distinct from good and coordinate with it he said the true is in the name of whatever proves itself to be good in the way of belief truth is a species of good that was right on 
That was exactly what is meant by the metaphysics of quality. Truth is a static intellectual pattern within a larger entity called quality. And of course, that statement itself kind of reminds us of what's going on in this corner. It's been a major topic in this corner, which has been so inspired by the but originally by the Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris debate where they were debating the nature of truth. And of course, when, when I, I, say, I repeat this all the time, when Peugeot says science is nested in religion or um, McGilchrist says the, the left brain hemisphere is nested in the holistic right hemisphere, the writer and the elephant. Um, this is where metaphysics quality fits into this corner in a nutshell. But James's view of truth was roughly what is most practical. And that can be problematic because if you're coming at this practicality from a malevolent agenda, you know, this practicality, this pragmatic truth can further any agenda, even the unsavory, immoral ones. And this is where um, James got flack for that he was saying, well, practicality is truth, and then um, some of the language he used made people think that you could just prostitute this truth for whatever agenda you wanted to further. And according to person, there's some truth in that. What Fiedrich saw was that the metaphysics of quality avoided this attack by making it clear that the good to which truth is subordinate is intellectual and dynamic quality, not practicality. The misunderstanding of James occurred because there was no clear intellectual framework for distinguishing social quality from intellectual and dynamic quality, and in his Victorian lifetime, they were monstrously confused. But the metaphysics of quality states that practicality is a social pattern of good. It is immoral for truth to be subordinated to social values, since that is a lower form of evolution, evolution devouring a higher one because practicality is not always moral. And we can think of numerous situations where something can be perfectly practically morally wrong, factory farming, for example. So let's change that Zen in the Art of Motorcycle quote a little bit. It's practical, but not any good. So there's a missing element in James' philosophy that the metaphysics of quality irons out by subsuming truth to dynamic quality ultimately even intellectual truth. If it's static or sequestered in an ivory tower, it can be immoral even if, even though it is of the highest evolutionary level. And another thing that Persig frames in a different way is the primacy of value, which is the cutting edge of experience. So for James, this is radical empiricism, the other element, the other major aspect of his philosophy. So the metaphysics of quality effectively unites pragmatism, which is truth is what's most practical for the job at hand, with radical empiricism, which is that valuing moment, and places it in an evolutionary framework that directs actions from this unity towards what's best. So number one, you know what's best because it works. Number two, you know what's best from experiencing that quality event. Number three, you know what's best because it because it doesn't benefit a lower level over a higher one. And number four, the gate is always open for what's better. So what does that look like? In this corner, we've determined that science is nested in value. Okay, so the parameters of the metaphysics of quality are, you know, according to these four things that I've come up with that I don't know are definitive or I don't know, you know, kind of a framework that I'm working with to try to figure this out in terms of, um, how qual how the metaphysics of quality actually works in the real world. What does this look like in example? And he's going to give us an example demonstrated here in this passage. The metaphysics of quality says that science is empirical rejection of biological and social values is not only rationally correct, it's also morally correct because the intellectual patterns of science are of a higher evolutionary order than the old biological and social patterns. That's the evolutionary moral framework. But the metaphysics of quality also says that dynamic quality, the value force that chooses an elegant mathematical solution to a laborious one, or a brilliant experiment over a confusing and conclusive one, and that is knowing innately what's better, is another matter altogether. Dynamic quality is a higher moral order than static scientific truth. And it is as immoral for philosophers of science to try to suppress dynamic quality as it is for church authorities to suppress scientific method. Dynamic value is an integral part of science. It is the cutting edge of scientific progress itself. 
And that, of course, describes the open gateway towards improvement, towards what's better. Is what's best the highest good, say, in religious terms? In the four features of quality I tried to lay out, in my rudimentary way, can indeed map onto religion because ultimately religion is supposed to be connecting to the highest good, which we can characterize as God, or God can be associated with the highest good depending on where you're coming from it. Okay, so number one, you know that God is because he directs you in the right direction. You see God operating your life in a practical way. Number two, the grace of God gives you the experience of God. Number three, in Christianity, which I'm going to use as the uh, example, the moral system of Christianity puts man at the top, at the top the uppermost position in the hierarchy of um, materialist or, or earthly experience and has the most responsibility that actually has the ability to guide this. God incarnates in man, which is roughly the equivalent of the intellectual level, because the intellectual level is really relegated to human, to man. And number four, it's time for Christianity to revitalize. It is stagnant, let's say, in general. It's got to go back to the source. It's got to rescue the father from the belly of the whale. And this takes us back to truth, harmony, and hitting the mark, which are all indelibly related, which come up again and again. So another big takeaway I have from this, the, from the quote, uh, which is, the misunderstanding of James occurred because there was no clear intellectual framework for distinguishing social quality from intellectual and dynamic quality and in his Victorian lifetime they were monstrously confused. So the last takeaway I have from that statement was also the implication that there is potential then for something beyond intellectual because he's he's reporting on a situation where the intellectual was not yet completely uh, reified in terms of levels, where in the Victorian era, social, the social good, social morality was still, even with some visionary like James, was still kind of, was kind of seen as the highest good. And I think we're seeing this now. I think we're seeing the separation between intellectual and what's next. And Peugeot calls it re-enchantment, which is a great term. It's a revivifying of strong social patterns and a rejection of the whole scale notion that any progress, any technological or otherwise progress is good. Now we have to be more discerning about the progress we're willing to adopt and the potential for progress that we want to actually push aside because it's not good. So you don't just accept progress whole scale as good anymore. And perhaps reinformed through this reenchantment, through more ancient ways of understanding, through more ways of knowing rather than propositional, through revivifying older ways of knowing, let's say, we enter something like a post-intellectual stage that actually unites science and religion, which is what James was trying to do which is what Phaedrus initially rejected as woo, and which the metaphysics of quality is ultimately presenting itself as a path as such. So I hope that makes sense, and I'll see you next time.